It's been many years since Maria Callas died. Yet the fascination she exerts is as great today as it was during her career. It's really like she's reaching out from the grave to grab hold of our imagination. She won't let go of it. Her records today are outselling those of other artists. There have been over 30 books written about her, which is a great deal more than famous figures such as Nijinsky or Laurence Olivier. And the question is, why? Uh, it's a difficult question, but it has to do, of course, with that enormous theatrical personality of hers as reflected by her voice. But it also has to do with another facet, because there was not only Collis the artist, but Maria the woman. And the story of Maria the woman is really just as fascinating. Fascinating, it's, it's, it's really one of the great tragic love stories of our time. I've been undefended all my life. You might be, as I have found out, frequently misunderstood, hated, attacked, and I have not been able to fight back. And you've had to sit back and take it in absolute silence. It hurts. You hate it because it is unjust. The world is full of unjustness. <laughs> She was there waiting to go on stage for the last big aria. Huh? And I saw, it was not the premiere, it was one of, of, of the performances. And I saw, and she was in a, in a, in a state of, of nervous that I went and said, Maria, what, for God's sake, I mean, you, it's now, I mean, you have the glory and, and you have performed. And, so, and he grabbed my arm, you know, like this squeeze and said, you know that every time I go out there, they are they are waiting to to get me. <laughs> Maria was actually born in Manhattan 
on 2nd December 1923 in a hospital in Washington Heights on the Upper West Side and christened Maria Cecilia Sophia Anna Kaloyeropoulou. The father had a pharmacy here in Greece. But uh, I think he had not uh, much success at the end. And then he took his wife and his daughter, the, the first daughter he had, and went to the States. And he made the name from Kaloyeropoulos, who is extremely difficult to pronounce, into Kalas. And uh, the mother was then pregnant. And Maria Kalas came one year later. Because of increasing tensions at home, school, at public school number 189, was not especially happy. Though her American upbringing was always a very strong influence. She played popular music constantly and she'd sing along with whoever was singing. Frank Sinatra, Cole Porter. Hernando's Hideaway was the big important song. I mean, she really liked that. And she liked Mexican songs. And she would harmonize to these rather sort of, you know, heart-rendering Mexican love songs. She loved going to the movies. And what she liked best were cowboy films, westerns. I think she just loved to get lost in the kind of the stories in the movies. And she, she talked out loud all the time while we went to, you know, in the film, she, she'd say, oh my God, oh, look, look what's going to happen. <gasps> All these comments out loud and people behind her say, shh, shh. But when Maria was 13, her mother decided she had had enough of her father. They were later divorced and in 1937, removed both daughters back to Athens. There, they lived in some poverty at number 61 Patisian Street. With the drop of her father, the effect on the already shy and introverted Maria was profound. For years, she wore baggy, drab clothes. And she says her mother always made these dark, little dresses with white collars. That was her obsession. She said, oh, my mother's always making these little dresses with white collars. And when I met Maria's sister, Jackie, I said, how is it that you were always so beautifully dressed and so elegant, and your sister always looked not like a rag bag, but I mean, she was just very poorly put together. Well, Jackie said that, you know, a lot of the clothes were made by their mother, but Maria didn't have the figure to wear them, and so she looked dumpy. mother must be a good mother to her children, yes or no? There is no going away from that. It is a responsibility. She's not doing anything special. It is her duty, not responsibility. It's her duty. There's where I'm as stiff as a German, if it can be called German. A mother, there's nothing extraordinary about, oh, how wonderful a mother she is. She's got to be wonderful. Otherwise, don't have children. If you don't even trust your mother, who do you Who trust? You? The program was that, of course, uh, I should become a singer, I should become an artist in any case. Usually what parents say is, well, I sacrificed myself for you, but you will do what I was supposed to do in life. But the mother did have the good sense to send her to the music conservatory here in Athens, where she attended the classes of a famous teacher, Elvira de Hidalgo with her best friend and fellow student at that time, Zoe Vlachopoulou. I remember, when I was born in 1939, in the area of Mrs. Hidalgo, I was a little girl. When she came to Madame Hidalgo's class in 1939, she was a tall, fat, dark-haired girl with beautiful eyes and great self-assurance. Judging by her appearance, I didn't think she would be able to sing. But when she opened her mouth, my own mouth fell right open. And Hidalgo, she was transfixed. Maria seemed to learn everything so quickly. By the end of her first term, she was speaking fluent Italian and French. 
She was very clever. Elle était très musicale et musicienne parce qu'elle connaissait très bien la musique. Elle jouait du piano très bien. She was very musical. She played the piano well. She was always the first to arrive in class and the last to leave. She listened to all my students, often for five hours at a time. She was fascinated by the idea of reaching the top notes. She asked me about her future. I said that if she continued like this, she would be able to achieve everything. Everything. After six months of training with the Hidalgo, I was immediately taken, engaged, shall we say, by the then six months old uh, opera in Greece on an agreement that I would not sing anywhere else. And the Hidalgo had seen to that uh, contract. So I would have a sum of money and uh, that would give me the possibility of studying patiently without having the necessity of going around to work. Because it was during the war, you know. It was a terrible time. Hunger and seeing people dying in the streets, walking everywhere because there was no transport whatsoever. Maria used to go four times a day to the conservatoire, quite a distance, backwards and forwards on foot. And if you had the money to get some sort of food, you got it. If you didn't, then you had to sell things, all your valuables had to be sold to the black marketeers and buy food. She was pushed in a way, but Maria had to do what she did. Although she had been singing since she was 14, her professional operatic debut was actually in a cinema, the Palace, because the National Theatre had no air raid shelter. She sang in Boccaccio by Franz von Zuppé. One year later, incredibly enough, she sang Tosca. But her first big public success was in the opera by Dalbert called Tiefland, conducted by Maestro Zoras. She was only 21. There was no electricity. So we used to sit at night with oil lamps, but every 10 minutes the lamps would go out. But Maria would insist on cleaning them and lighting them again. We must rehearse, 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 she would say. I think the secret was her willpower. Callas was born with all sorts of disadvantages. Maria was not born a beautiful woman. Maria was fat, obese, ungraceful. When you realize the type of body she started out with in life, which was like that of a pachyderm, her voice was not of the most beautiful quality. Um, and still she uh, made this instrument the most expressive, the most telling, the most true to the music that she interpreted of all of the singers of her day. We'd sit down at the table and we'd have something in front of us and, and she'd say, oh, Nadia, what is that? Mmm, it looks absolutely delicious. Is that some Greek or Turkish specialty or whatever it was? I mean, Turkish, because we were in Turkey at the time. I'd say, well, I, I don't know. Some... And she'd say, well, can I have a tiny taste? And so she'd, she'd pick a little out of your plate and then she'd pick a little bit more and then she'd pick out of the thing that was absolutely next to that. And finally, she'd eaten practically everything you had in your plate. 
and she tried everything out of everyone's plate. It drove me mad. She loved ice cream. The minute we'd finish a meal, she'd turn to the waiter and say, would you have have any ice cream? And if she, well, the waiter said, yes, we have vanilla and chocolate, well, that wasn't good enough. She wanted all kinds of different flavors, and the, the more the merrier. So I went to one of these gatherings, and here came this extraordinary ballsy lady. It was big, everything was immense, you know, big eyes, big mouth, big teeth, I mean, beautiful, big nose, and rather hairy, rather big, big bust. Big, you know. I was impressed by that gigantic. She looked like the Statue of Liberty. Because of her success in Greece, it was inevitable that sooner or later we would lose her. And in 1947, she was invited to Verona in Italy to sing in La Gioconda under the most influential opera conductor of his time, Tullio Serafin. <laughs> I had the opportunity to recommend her because I was invited to open that season with Faust. And the director of the Arena of Verona was in New York at the time and I went to pay a visit to him and thanking him for the contract and so on. And he told me, but I would like very much to open the season with Gioconda, but it doesn't exist any Gioconda in the world, he said to me. And I told him right away, you know, I think I, I have a Gioconda in my pocket. It was so important that she met there Tullio Serafin, who understood her potential, understood her musicality, her talent, and her voice. He used to call her una grande vociaccia. Vociaccia, it's a, li a little bit pejorative. I mean, it means a, a, an ugly voice, but grande means a big voice, a great voice. A great, ugly voice, in a way, <laughs> yes. The voice of Collis the artist was being transformed. The body of Maria the woman was not. And it just so happened at this time that Audrey Hepburn was filming Roman Holiday in Italy. Maria suddenly announced that she wished to become as thin as Audrey Hepburn. It was utterly amazing, but in a year she lost 37 kilos, which is about 80 pounds. She was still a very young woman, however, so her flesh hung off her like an empty bag. So she went to tremendous efforts, gymnastics, massages, and so on, in order to reabsorb all this loose flesh. She never managed with the ankles. In fact, one of the reasons she never wanted to perform Carmen was because she would have to show her feet and ankles in the dance. And she just didn't want to do that. Maria the woman was now wanting to be the equal of Collis the artist. I think I was lucky in that I heard about number four of perhaps five performances of Gioconda in the open air and on the biggest stage perhaps in the world. And the things that were wonderful was the scale of the singing, the scale of the whole voice, the edge, the way in which she dominated everything. The battle is twofold. First of all, with the voice, to make the voice do her bidding. In other words, if she was a military commander, how would you get the troops to do what you planned to do? Then the other one, of course, was always with the public. One seen it when she had an easy public, so to speak, in England. But one saw it with a very difficult public in Italy. I mean, a public that was, was full of excitement, full of reaction, uh, was worth infusing. 
uh, worth getting into that state of excitement which an Italian public can get into, but which was occasionally hostile. And I've seen her have a, a battle with the public and win it. What I learned from Serafine was that you must serve music because music is so enormous and can envelop you into such a state of perpetual anxiety and torture. But it is our first and main duty. He always found a reason for something. What he said impressed me was, when one wants to find a gesture, when you want to find how to act on stage, all you have to do is listen to the music. The composer has already sought seen to that. If you take the trouble to really listen with your soul and with your ears, and I say soul and ears because the mind must work, but not too much also, uh, you will find every gesture there. Immediately after my debut in Italy, no agent would give me a job because I was not loved that much. I was something new to listen to and they disliked anything that took them away from tradition. Every four or five months that I would have a role. Many people that used to say, well, her high notes are beautiful, but her middle notes are not. And the other ones say, oh, the middle notes are beautiful, but the top are no good. In other words, they wouldn't agree. <laughs> what impressed me was they used to say that, uh, well, she does know how to move on stage. She lived in total fantasy, always, because, first of all, she was absolutely blind, you know. When she was on stage, she lived in a kind of haze. She couldn't see anything. So, in her fantasies, she was dreaming, dreaming, dreaming on stage, absolutely dreaming. She, that's, why, that's why she changed completely personality. She brought out what the character was supposed to be. It, it, it happened something magic. I mean, it's, it's easy to say Callas was magic, but there, there was something superhuman that happened. You know, I don't know how to describe it, find the right words for it, but she was possessed. She literally changed the face of opera. It was a recurrent joke among us to divide the history of opera into eras, B.C. and A.C., before and after Callas. came with something at the time totally new and that he's she brought finally drama to the opera and what it meant what it was meant by, by the origin of the opera when Monteverdi and all the Camerata Fiorentina let's say invented this new uh, expression it was a melodrama it was a recitar cantando which means that you were performing. It was a singing actor. And then with the evolution of the singing, with the 19th century, the new composers, all went into the bel canto, and little by little then lost in the performers the strength of the drama. It became some sort of beautiful sound exhibition. And uh, it was a betrayal, as a matter of fact. Callas, with her strength of drama, brought back to the origin of opera what it means. So, after her great success in Verona, it was inevitable that sooner or later she would be invited to Italy's most important opera house, La Scala in Milan. Serafine was there, so was Toscanini and Giulini, and of course, Antonio Ghiringhelli the superintendent of La Scala, sort of general manager. He was a rich businessman with a big personality who felt married to La Scala, I would say, and didn't take kindly to demanding prima donnas disrupting his marriage. He wanted Maria, but only on his terms. She wanted, she demanded to be acknowledged as the star she was. Impasse. 
But after another triumph at La Fenice in Venice, where among other things she learned and sang the lead in Ipuritani in just four days because another singer had fallen ill, and also after some pressure from his old friend Meneghini, Ghiringelli could not ignore her anymore. In December 1951, she made her debut in I Vespri Siciliani. These were perhaps her greatest years. And here it was that she fell under the spell of the great director, Luchino Visconti. Luchino entered on the scene of Maria around 54, with all the splash of all this authority, his glamour, and all his bull, and everything was there to make her the most glamorous lady of the stage. And he certainly succeeded, he inspired her a lot. She never fully acknowledged that. She didn't like to acknowledge it. But as Serafine molded the musician in Maria, so Visconti shaped the actress. Luchino could do anything with Maria dramatically. She was like a schoolgirl around him, one with a terrible crush. Hey, où on tâchait de déranger le joyeux de Maria? Un moment avant le joyeux, le bruit. One evening, some people tried to disrupt Maria. There was an anti-Maria group in, in the top balcony. They started to make a terrible noise during the most difficult part of the aria. But, uh, as usual, at the end of the first act, the fans threw flowers. But some sounded rather heavy as they landed on the stage. Were, were they plastic? Marble? No, they were vegetables, radishes, celery. <laughs> Quick, I said, pick them up and leave the flowers. But Maria, although she can't see very well, has the ears of Dionysus. She already knew that more than mere flowers were being thrown. So she picked up some radishes and showed them to the audience. And then she made a sweeping bow. Naturally, it was a great triumph. <laughs> they, they were found kissing in, the, in her dressing room, you know, passionately. But he played a bit, this kind of games with his big ladies, because he was a very attractive man. Women loved him very much, and he had a past history of having had great stormy love affairs with great ladies. So every now and then there was this uh, situation in which he found himself deliberately. In order to conquer his women, <clears throat> he just had to give them once the, the full treatment. I was thoroughly spoiled by him before we even started working together because he was... Uh, the Grand Seigneur was treating the uh, prima donna so lavishly and... Uh, I felt that. He made a point of pointing it out, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. I don't know whether I'm really always on that pedestal for him or for others. But uh, Visconti made me discover how to act. He taught me something without my, uh, his knowing it, that the less I move without evident reason or profound reason, the more it is my own personality. No. Oh, <laughs> 
might seem corny, but it's really hard not to see the life of Maria Callas as a sort of fairy story. After all, she was the classic ugly duckling that became the swan. I mean, look how she began her life. It was with a voice that nobody really wanted or understood, and it was in a body that certainly no one wanted. And there were also tremendous psychological blocks she had to overcome from earliest childhood. A pushy mother who sh whose love she wanted and never really had, and jealousy of a sister. These were all things which left a vivid imprint on her and which she exercised throughout her life, primarily on the stage. And the fascinating thing is really the emergence of this artist, this swan, shall we say, and the great cost that Maria, the woman, paid for it. enormous reason of my life, in fact, an enormous career, a successful career, <coughs> that is being a happy wife and have, having uh, made a, a successor of my marriage. I'm very proud of it, and it's the main thing in the life of a woman, I feel. Giovanni Battista Meneghini, who was a middle-aged industrialist who, like her mother, saw in Maria a chance for a destiny of his own. They were soon married, and Meneghini's money provided the support and bought the time Maria needed to build her career. Battista Meneghini era stato così intelligente. Battista Meneghini had the intelligence to understand that his work would only be complete when this woman had become elegant with style and flair. He was the one who said, Make her lots of clothes. Make her look good. She, being rather tight-fisted, would probably not have bothered. He understood that from this transformation, a new callus would emerge. I've always thought the later view of Meneghini as a pest and, and somebody who latched onto her and all that. I've always thought that was a, a false and unfair view. I think he made a vast contribution to her. I think he gave her confidence. I think he gave her background. I think he gave her advice. I think he was a very shrewd uh, Italian businessman, Latin businessman. And I think that, that she needed that. And I don't know to what degree she was involved with him, but I think she was, I think she was pretty involved. I think she was, uh, I think it was a, what you'd call a good relationship for several years. These are all the Maria Callas letters. Thousands. I have thousands of letters. Letters, documents of all kinds. Would you like to hear one? Let's see. At last I have got to my destination after a journey. And on the top it says, my dear adored one. Adorato. Adorato. These are love letters, letters overflowing with love, which contain love and very little else. The other things are only incidental. The main part of all these letters is love. It was when we left for Buenos Aires, and she was crying like a child, leaving Meneghini in Genova. And I remember this. It was maybe the only one moment when I saw Maria Callas really moved, really sincere, really caring for somebody. She was crying and she was desperate leaving Meneghini because Meneghini represented for her not only the husband, he was her father, her brother, uh, the security that she found in life.
was a very loving husband. He adored her and probably, like all adoration, suffocated a lot in her. And what it is worst because of this love, he made her make so many mistakes. Some lawsuits unnecessary to newspapers and things. And he excited her sometimes backstage against a colleague. And you know, when you are under pressure of a performance, when your nerves are under an enormous strain and demand, when somebody comes near and says, you know, we did this, has done this and this other one, has said that, this person explodes. There is no other way. And sometimes he did that. And uh, <sighs> difficult, difficult. <laughs> absolutely vituperative about singers whom she did not respect, who were late, who did not give, who did not try, uh, and who were less professional than she was. It was very difficult to be as professional as she was, but I think people who were less so, uh, she did not like. I remember her fury about a singer whom she had suggested, but a great deal less senior than Maria, who sang wonderfully as nearly as the, the maid, then Medea, who on the first night sang the aria, which she has. Maria was kind of reclined, and it's uh, an aria to try and comfort her. And she sang it to this reclining body, then sort of collapsed towards the body at the end. And there was tremendous applause after the aria. And she turned to the audience and smiled and acknowledged with a bow the applause. And Maria was furious about it afterwards because she'd moved out of character at that moment. I had to remind her that this was a singer I had to defend her. This is a singer you suggested. That's why we got her. Yes, but how can you behave like that? Said, but she's not very experienced. Second year or something like that. And she did sing very well. I don't care if she sang well. Realm Opera makes headlines with a performance that didn't happen. Or at least soprano Maria Callas refused to carry on after the first act. Arriving before the overture, here's Maria looking fine. And to listen to her sing Bellini's Norma, a glittering audience had gathered. The stars of the Italian screen, like Anna Magnani, quite a fiery character herself when she wants to be, and Silvana Pampanini. American society hostess Elsa Maxwell must be thinking that this almost equals one of her own fabulous parties. A fashion parade straight out of who's who, with enough material to keep the glossy magazines happy for weeks. You don't know whether to look at dresses or faces, though some faces you can't miss, of course. 3,000 people, from artists to aristocrats, from dancers to diplomats, as brilliant a first-night audience as the Eternal City has ever seen, all here to listen to Maria Menghini Callas, soprano. To crown the occasion, the President of the Italian Republic himself, the senior Giovanni Gronchi, but even the president has to be content with one act only. Then Maria Cara says she doesn't feel well. So as not to disappoint you too, our cameraman dropped in on a rehearsal. Perhaps he had a premonition what would happen on the night. Maria's voice was perfect. Maria has been known to walk out before. So if you want to be sure of hearing her, don't get all dressed up. Just go to a rehearsal. She usually stays to the end of those. Miss Callis, why have you come over so suddenly? Well, I don't think I've come over suddenly at all. I came here... Uh, for this concert, which will take place at the St. James Palace, and it's for the Mountbatten Trust, and it in, isn't quite sudden. In which did you're you expect singing me? Well, I don't think many people did. Why? 
You seem to have arrived uh, very quietly this time. I usually try to arrive quietly. Well, you're singing uh, with Sir Malcolm Sargent, aren't you? He's accompanying yes, you on the and piano. Yes, with uh, Yehudi Menudi. So I assume that Sir Malcolm is one conductor on whom, with whom you are on very good terms. I am always on best terms with all conductors. I didn't. I wouldn't like this to go ahead. No. In fact, a lot of unfair things have been said about Maria. Her cancellation record was not as the world believed it to be at all. She cancelled relatively rarely. She was too much of a professional to be cancelling. But equally, it was this whole question with her of whether or not she actually felt the chemistry was right to enable her to give the standard of performance that she thought she ought to be giving because she had no desire to shortchange the public and she had no desire to shortchange herself. And she was always determined when she got out on that stage to give the public, state it crudely, value for money. She was going to say, here I am, and this is how I perform and how I sing. And if she felt she was going to be a notch or two below what she regarded as her, as her high standards, then you could be in difficulties with her. fighter, not out of necessity, or rather not out of love of fight, because I loathe fighting. I'm sick to the stomach after it. But if I have to defend myself, I have that much pride to say, well, there's no way out. Go ahead and defend yourself. I thought I would become great to be able to have freedom of movement, in other words, Should stability, happiness to be able to perform better under the best circumstances, under the best uh, mental frame of mind and all that. Well, it was a lie. It's not true. The more famous you become, the more difficult things are. And it's freedom of the press and none of our freedom. Do I have freedom? I can't justify myself. I cannot live a normal life. It's a long, lonely life. Everything was going great for her. She was one of the most famous women in the world. But there was this, what would you call it, fatal flaw that you find in classic Greek tragedy. Up until this time, it had been all work and no play. She had had love from Menegini, her husband, or you might better say security. But with her great weight loss, she had turned herself into a very glamorous, sexy woman. And for the first time, 
Maria, the woman, wanted real fulfillment. It was just at this crucial moment in her life that she fell in love. But the man she fell in love with was a shady character. He was a man who collected famous women. It's rumored that he had paid $10,000 for one night with Ava Peron. And he wanted to collect Collis. She was willing to be collected. After all, this was the period in which Maria, the woman, wanted to be on an equal footing with Collis, the artist. Oh, it's very easy that newspapers say, oh, that terrible Callas, I gained so much money in one evening. Oh, she is a capricious so, 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 so. But it's not so. What am I supposed to say? The general manager that was supposed to, that I had warned him and I told him I would be sick and if there is a double and if there is not, what will happen? And uh, that these people say, for instance, something like the, the Rome. I told him I'm, I'm not well. Now, something might come wrong. What is the person who is my double? Nobody can double Callas. My work is alone. It is creation. So you have to be alone to do that. But on the other hand, when you work, it would be so nice to be able to come home and have a nice, honest shoulder to lean on. I had hoped that of my husband. I was so wrong. to the music, to the theater, like, like a priest in the religion. And uh, this was continued to the moment in which the door of the high society became open for her. And there, uh, in this moment, of course, the temptation for her was very hard because sure it was a sentimental problem, but also this the possibility for in a moment of her life to live a human life. She was very prim, she was very you know, very strange sometimes, very moralistic. But the reason was because she was shy, and in the end, she never had really confrontation with a man. Never had a clash, I mean, big bang with a man that ends up in a, in a great sexual or emotional relationship. Never happened to her. Never happened until Onassis appeared. It was considered a very redoutable figure. And he had uh, this beautiful Christina, which became a kind of showcase for him. Uh, he had this window display of uh, celebrities. Churchill was there all the time. But generally, the big, important people were not going there. I mean, Churchill was old and retired, and he was a memory, so he didn't have anything to lose going 
in the cruise with on asses. Other people were really nervous. I remember that Grace Kelly, Princess Grace and uh, the Ranieri family were not at all uh, in good terms with Onassis. When he made the big splashy thing with Maria, then it was a tremendous coup, publicity, publicity coup for him. There's no way, no way to deny it. Really, she made him more famous and more respectable than he was. She gave him a lot of uh, position, in fact, he yeah, ended up being accepted in Monte Carlo fully and all of that. I mean, he could live without that because he had enough money and enough power, but he wanted more. He wanted to be accepted. I'm sorry. I can't talk. When are you going to be going there? Do you mind clearing the way, gentlemen? Huh? When will you be going there, Miss Callis? Leaving this afternoon the jet. Do you know why leaving me for the how do you feel about the court litigation that's coming up? I'm giving no interviews, do you mind, gentlemen? Please, Miss Callis, do you have any disagreement in Dallas? I'm giving no interview. Did you have any trouble in Dallas? Did you have any trouble in Dallas? Not at all. I'm giving no interview. The only reason you have any... Why did you cut short your trip? Please. Are you going to marry Mr. I said don't. I'm not answering any interview. Now stop it. Miss Callis, does all this attention disturb you? Gentlemen, I'm giving no interview. Please. Did you have any, any argument at all in Dallas? Is that why you cut short your hand? Don't be in search of any scandal. Please stop it. Go. What do you expect to accomplish when you go to I England? said, will you please stop it? Ms. Callis, you said you expect to sing, but you're not singing in Dallas. I said, please stop it. Well, she was very impressed. She doesn't want to talk to you. Let's move right along, please. Look, Mac. Take it easy, Mac. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> why not? When you're nice, I smile. <laughs> we try to be nice. When you push me around, I don't like yeah. it. Well, we don't mean to push you around. Well, I wish you'd stand still so you wouldn't have to. But I have to walk around. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's much harder for my cameraman than it is for you. Why don't you stop? 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 this romantic squabble that everyone's uh, been predicting? This is no romantic squabble. It's a separation. That's all. Okay. Uh, oh. Have you talked to Mr. Onassis? I'm going to sue him. all my friends. I am answering no more questions. That's all, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> You must, before you do something, realize there might be consequences. If you're honest, hmm, it's a big price to pay for it. You're going to really pay and pay and pay. But you're going to meet a lot of dishonest people, a lot of weak people who are going to try to pull you down so fast, so much. Being honest uh, is a hell of a price to pay. Glory goes to people's head, not my head. Glory terrifies me because you're quite uncomfortable up there. But other people around you, they get drunk. It's a wine that goes to the head. Because I have unfortunately seen them nearly always betray me. Everybody does that. You have given up your uh, citizenship, that's correct? Yes, that is correct. And are you taking your Greek citizenship back? I have already taken my Greek citizenship. What is the reason behind this, Madame Callas? Well, the real reason I could even say it is that I am a free woman, you see. Because, uh, during, um, with the Greek law, who is not married after 1946 in church, is not married. So you understand? I understand completely. And now, do you have any intention to marry Mr. Onassis? Oh, those are not questions to... Uh... No, right now I'm a free woman. I'm very happy to be so. That is why I had to give up this American citizenship, unfortunately. You, can't, you understand? <laughs> she didn't want to talk to people. She hated journalists, photographers, I remember. Uh, in 1952, when we, after Mexico, we, she was my guest in, uh, in my villa in Ravenna, in the Adriatic coast, and uh, the villa was surrounded by journalists from, photographers from Life magazine, from New York. She didn't want to give an interview. I thought she was faking. So I thought she should be flattered that they come from America to take her picture for Life magazine, and those years was the most important magazine. No, she could, she would not see him. She hated to give interviews. She wanted privacy, and uh, she needed.
The only thing that she got was a full uh, sex affair. She didn't need the glamour, she had enough glamour. She didn't need the high society because she had, whenever she wanted to go, she was welcome. People were laying their fur coats on, under their feet. She could have all that luxury, except for this emotional and, and really physical relationship that uh, Onassis provided. It was the first man that gave her, gave her that. She told me. It's absolutely, I met his mercy because I'm a, it's like a virgin who's uh, suddenly, you know, she goes through that uh, incredible planet of revelations of uh, physical life. But she wanted to work. That is not professional, perhaps, like music or singing, where you really have to work every day, 12 hours a day. A singer has to practice. So it becomes a mental habit that you have to work. So she got bored with all this uh, cafe society nonsense, and she began to think back of uh, singing again. And we found her right in that moment, in 63, in Paris, that she held my hand when, as we came down the big staircase. She said, we've got to work again together. So finally, uh, with, with David, not only one thing, but a double bill, uh, it was the idea was Tosca and Covent Garden, Norma in Paris, and switch them. When she came down from the old dressing rooms down the stage, and she was in this incredibly pale pink chiffon with the white lace hanging from the head, and it was somehow everything that you'd always thought Tosca should be and never had been. There was no funny bonnet and and a lot of old velvet and something rather heavy and stick and all that rubbish. And she was absolutely vulnerable. And my heart leapt. You know, it sounds silly, but it did. I just went, this is it. I remember Maria calling me in the morning sometime. Tito, I'm sorry, but I, I am not 100% OK today. I don't feel very well. And uh, I'm a little preoccupied. I have to change. Please be ready to follow me because uh, I'm sure I will change everything on stage, move in the other direction. Then she was there near the table and I was singing near my little desk. And she bent a little too much against the real candle. And her beautiful wig with all the curls went in fire. I'm short sized too. But I saw, fortunately, some little smoke, because she was against the light, little smoke coming up from her wig. She didn't move. Then I walked toward her, always singing. It was a duetto. And when I came close to her, I realized that it was just beginning to get fire here in the smoke. And maybe three seconds or four seconds later, it was uh, something terrible. So I went here, I put my hand on the wig, like Scarpia trying to touch Tosca, and she slipped out of my hand with a sense of dis disgust that I, Scarpia tried to put the hand on, on her. And she turned, keeping singing, and then she turned to me and said, Grazie, Tito. But she was waiting for me there. Scarpia is a man of shouts, I'm a monster, I'm Hitler, I'm Goebbels, but in the end, he had a real deep wound to heal, and he never healed. The fact that he could not be loved. A night with Scarpia could be, for a woman, a little more exciting than the usual routine with the beautiful uh, Roman stud. And little by little, I was conveying to her the idea that Scarpia was a bit like Onassis. I suddenly found myself a little short from saying, it's a kind of Aristo, you know, kind of... I didn't say that, but I, she read my mind. And she understood where her Scarpia was. So the whole idea that when she kills him, she kills her uh, the possibility of loving him. It's all going to be very sexy and all of that. And she prepares herself for this uh, outrageous uh, but very attractive experience. And she, while she drinks, 
A glass of water to comfort her, she sees the blade sparkling, the blade of the knife on the table. She remains absolutely transfixed, looking at this blade for what seemed to be a century. And when he arrives to kiss her, she grabs the, the blade and the knife and kills him with one stroke, right at the heart. That was the leading uh, idea of her uh, hysterical I mean, uh, eruption of killing. I have to kill this man on Arsis. of these Toscas led Maria to accept two performances of the same role at the Met. She returned to New York in triumph and was met at Kennedy Airport by cheering and adoring fans. The lines for standing room tickets formed four days before they went on sale. Over 1,000 people slept outside the Met box office. Only for her would I do this. Nobody else. What's so great about it? She's the only star in opera today which, who has, you know, real glamour. She's a real star in every sense of the word. She's a great actress. She's a great singer. She's a fabulous personality, you know? I think it's a shame that she hasn't been here. And now that she has agreed to come back, I think to miss her would be really a crime. This woman is undoubtedly the greatest singer of this century. The problem Callas faced during her years with Onassis was a loss of identity, which was tantamount to a loss of her voice. Although Maria the woman was blooming, Callas the artist was really fighting for her life. And gradually this wonderful machinery she had built up to produce what she did was coming apart. On top of this, so many old nightmares returned to plague her. In particular, her greatly unjustified reputation for cancellations like the infamous Rome walkout or her being fired from the Metropolitan Opera. What happened in all this was that a sort of, you might say, schizophrenia set in, and set in, got it, went out of control. And Collis versus Maria became a raging interior battle. Uh, it even led to an abortion of a child by Onassis and an attempted suicide. He never gave her any penny, a penny. Maybe not, no money, nothing. <clears throat> no jewels, nothing. Maria was treated like a poor servant in his... Um... Well, of course she had. She paid all the bills herself. She had dream, the dream of a poor Greek child. The very moment that her career was declining, to step out a la grande by marrying the richest man on, on earth, who happened to be also Greek. Actually, she, was, she found herself in a little, little trouble, and that's why she came back recording to get some money from royalties, because she needed money. The only thing is, he invest, invested her money. She bought half a boat with him, imagine. Cargo boat, which she sank. But he, after he used and used and squeezed the juice out of uh, Maria, he just dumped her.
absolutely devastated because she had put all her trust in this man and she adored him and she really desperately wanted to be his wife. And she couldn't understand how someone could deceive her like that. I mean, this is something that she never got over. She was never nasty about Jackie Kennedy, never. She just said that she had never met her and she did not know her. She couldn't judge her. But she was furious with Onassis and really blamed him. She said, I cannot understand how after so many years together and after declaring his love and knowing that I loved him as much as I did, that he should do this to me. And that he, that he deceived me, that he let me think until the very end that he was going to be with me. And that's something that I think hurt her enormously, more than she could ever express. There were terrible scenes, violent scenes, like something out of an ancient Greek tragedy. There was undoubted passion, but he wasn't interested in what interested her, and she certainly wasn't interested in what interested him. Après avoir été marié avec Jacqueline Kennedy, je pense qu'il a épousé Jacqueline Kennedy pour ennuyer Maria Callas. After his marriage to Jacqueline Kennedy, I think he married her primarily to annoy Maria Callas. I remember she used to phone me in the middle of the night. She slept badly. And once she said, what am I going to do? He is there again, outside the door. It was Onassis. He's shouting at me through the window. Maria, open the door or I'll drive the rolls straight through it. Maria, ouvre moi la porte ou je l'enfonce avec la rolls. <laughs> Lei è stata veramente colpita e credo che la sua morte è nata quel giorno, capito? Poi a poco She was letting herself die little by little. You see, even when he was on his honeymoon in London, Onassis would call her on the phone every morning. So she began hoping again. When he got ill, for example, it was she who went to visit him in the hospital. So as long as she was hoping to get him back, she had a reason to go on living. She used to sit on that stool in that beautiful gray outfit looking incredibly composed, those beautiful black suede shoes and a lovely handbag. And she was the woman who really had everything. And I mean, one was suddenly aware that there was a kind of an awful sadness about her. She, she, it was, it, there was something not right. You know, she was doing it all and she was behaving impeccably and she was sitting there, but there was, I don't know, there was, a, there was something terribly wrong somewhere. And I think that unlike some singers I know who escape into a character, she used to work herself into the character. She used to work it all out and then become that. But I don't think that she was ever lucky enough the way I know lots of people who can actually become a character like that and totally forget themselves. And I'm not sure that she was ever able to forget that sadness somewhere.
she wanted everything to be perfection for those she loved. And uh, she was that way about all her women, woman friends or her girlfriends, or particularly the younger ones, you know. She was always very worried about their love life and what was going to happen. And uh, the telephone conversations when she called me from Paris, it was always, first of all, are you asleep? Well, of course, I always was. It was three o'clock in the morning or two. <laughs> the second question was, how was Mr. X, who was in my life at the time, and uh, the third uh, mention was, I think you ought to get rid of him. I don't like him at all. I mean, <laughs> you know, he's no good. Get somebody else. Perché c'è chi ti passa la palestra un poco? Non potrei farlo. È inutile tentare. Se vuoi parlarmi, puoi farlo, ma senza avermi vicino a toccarmi. Che cosa hai fatto? Che cosa hai fatto? Non soffri anche tu come me ora. Perché tu non arriva io voglio soffrire! Questo stesso Dio ti condannerà, basta! Sì, basta, e che cosa vuoi da me? Lasciami seppellire i figli e piangerli! Uh, torna piuttosto a seppellire la tua sposa! Sì, ci andrò! Ci andrò, ma senza i miei due bambini! È inutile! È inutile! Niente è più possibile ormai! After her break with Onassis, Callas desperately needed an identity, as much as Maria the woman needed an identity. But she was afraid. You see, she had always sung for the approval of others, actually, and on the support of others. There was first her mother, then there was Minigini, and after Onassis, there was no one. She was afraid to get back on the stage with her voice in the condition it was in, so she tried diversionary careers, you might say. First a film, with Pasolini on Medea, then directing an opera production in Turin, and finally teaching at Juilliard. None of these really gave her any real satisfaction or this much needed identity. The only thing left to her was to try singing again, and the support she found there was with De Stefano. It was all really part of a game she was playing with Onassis to show him that she wasn't beaten. With De Stefano, she had a new man in her life, and with her concerts with him, she was back before the public. The tragedy, this Greek tragedy again, was that both were a sham. They were a lie, and she knew it. And it was ultimately this lie that really destroyed her. Well, throughout my whole life, I always thought I should never sing because I was never good and all that. I'm the first terrible critic of myself. But uh, I really never said I will not be singing again. I said that to myself 10,000 times. <laughs> but uh, I really never officially declared that I would not sing anymore anymore. I've, uh, I had uh, created some bad habits. As a matter of fact, I think that uh, on the whole, I have improved. I had acquired a sort of a, as they called it, a wobble on the high notes, mm -hmm. which is a pulsation and I managed to improve that. Now, during the concerts, uh, I will improve even more the whole status of the voice, because there's nothing like the stage that can make you work properly. I can understand why emotionally she needed the tool. She had not sung since 1965, her last performance was at Covent Garden as Tosca, and uh, she longed to feel that she was still loved, that she was still respected. And um, Giuseppe Di Stefano needed also that tour, I believe. And it was not really, it, it would never have happened without him because she simply did not have the confidence to do it on her own. It was an artistic disaster. Nobody can claim otherwise. The first concert that was meant to be given at the festival hall was cancelled. Well, you're implying that she was frightened yeah. and that uh, Mr. Yes, Di Stefano of course she was frightened. persuaded her almost and against her will. On no, the question of the, the artistic value yeah. of the tour, let me quote Definitely. one let me quote one 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 English critic who described Callas' voice as a strained a strained horse shadow in her former voice. His reaction was to well, he's, a, he's, a, he's a member of the public. She was he's the, a member of the public. She never was so beautiful. The public was enthusiastic. But what was she her made voice a lot of money when she still didn't have the boat? 
the, the, the ship, you know, the cargo, you, making yeah. money. Did you see her she face? She was happy, but I, did, I mean, I didn't do all this. Did you see her face during that interview when she was trying to prove that she was improving? Her face was in such pain because she knew. Oh, yes. did, did, you not, did you not think That's that she was in distress during the tour, that she was unhappy with her musical performance? So That's really the essence of it, isn't it? What but is the tragedy? She was, was she happy to be back? That's the point, isn't of it? Of course she was happy. The, so uh, Miss Ariana, letters, I yeah. got letters. This letter is the most beautiful thing because she is what better after having everything in opera and in the social life to be back to singing. And I said, last night I could not sleep. Wait a yes, minute. Yes. I could not sleep and he said, finally I had the courage to listen to the tape of last night. Boy, what a progress. I'm so happy. I don't read the uh, criticisms because you see, I know exactly what I do before anybody tells me. So I don't want to read them and this way uh, disturb my peace of mind and my nerves. So I feel that if I don't read criticisms, it's better. Naturally, the voice is not what it used to be 12, 20 years ago. Nobody pretends that. So it's natural. The audience knows that. I know it. They can't just applaud the legend uh, if you don't give them something to... Uh... And after all, what is the legend? Uh, the public made me. What is a legend? I and think I'm a very human, <laughs> human being. If I wasn't human, I, I probably would have sung better. She did see herself as Maria, and there was this other being that was Callas. And she talked about Callas as La Callas. She spoke of this other part of herself. And there was Maria, who was a very charming, sometimes difficult, sometimes infuriating, sometimes coy, lovable, wonderful friend. And then there was Kalas, who was the woman who was on stage, who, did, who was the artist. And I remember, for instance, her listening to records, her own voice, um, when we were in Greece on an island, and she at the end of the record, she looked very sad, very pensive, and she said, Carlos will never sing that way again. At the end of her life, she became more and more of a recluse. Many of her friends deserted her, and those who did not kept their distance. It also became increasingly difficult to see her. You'd have to phone five times before you got through. Her maid would say, Madame is in the bath, or Madame is at the hairdressers, or Madame is having a manicure. And even when you got her at the fifth attempt, it would then prove difficult to find a time that suited both of us. So eventually, I'm afraid one just didn't bother. And I know one evening I had to leave her after about an hour, so I was going to hear something at the Paris Opera. But Maria said, you can't go. So I said, look, I'm terribly sorry, but I promised one or two that I will go. Well, who's singing? So I told her, I said, well, I'm going to put a waste of time going to listen to those. And who's going to go? Well, I mean, that's even more of a waste of time. And she was determined to try and prevent me from getting out of the flat. And she wanted me to stay and talk like and have supper child. with her. Uh, and I mean, just talk to her. And you see, this loneliness was, was really quite, quite terrifying. Maria Callas, through her life, showed that you can be the most successful person in your field. But still, the most important thing is love, passion. So every woman who is a passionate woman feels sympathy for this Maria, for Maria Callas, because they realize that this, all this success means very little. The most important thing is love. After such immense success, she, she, she was crying. She said, ah, I was, I was horrible, I was horrible, I was no good. She's the kind of artist who was never happy. People like this, they cannot open and they suffer. They, then they don't want to show it and they take pills. These pills they were damaging the brain. She was taking three pills, then later she forgot she took three pills, and she took another three. She was falling on the floor like a... 
She didn't want to fight anymore. She, she was going to taking these sleeping pills and waiting for death. First word, when I met in 72, she says, uh, she said, uh, caro Pippo, ogni giorno, per fortuna, un giorno di meno. Every day, thank God, is one day less. very, very tormented person. I mean, she was never, ever relaxed. One day she told me that what made her probably a great actress that was, that she was, she was trying to keep an equilibrium between half of the brain completely lucid and half of the brain completely gone. died around 1.30 or 2 in the afternoon. I was there before 4. She was already on her deathbed. Very, very beautiful. Part of the face was slightly blue, which by medical advice is normal in such a heart condition failure. I had arranged her in such a beautiful way, dressed her in very, very simple way, and she has a wonderful tress 
on the side. And she was so beautiful and so magical that I understand the miss there again. I really began to cry like a child. I seldom I cried that much. I really I couldn't stop. I was so much... Uh, also regret because I realized that we had uh, abandoned her. Perhaps if we had devoted really more time as friends, instead of taking for granted that uh, she should resolve her problems by herself, I, I realized that we've been, we have been unfair. Perhaps we have been more close to this woman, give her a sense of uh, life around her, she wouldn't have died. That was my deep, deep regret. I feel, felt very guilty. In life, when you talk, you're all dressed up, you know? You're ready to meet people, to talk, but when you are on stage and you sing, you are nude. You have to open your, uh, your soul, your people through your singing get to know how you are made. When you are born for something, you don't, you don't worry about it. You even start to hate it. That's why some artists cannot last forever because they, they get bored. I mean, every night you have to repeat the same thing and you want to live, you want to enjoy life, you want, you want to know. And the woman like Callas, she was born, she was more, more, as I said before, a woman, a woman, a woman, a woman with a voice. It was not a voice with a woman. So her life was love, success as a woman. This was the fight that she lost. <laughs> 